Hello, I want to welcome you to our YouTube channel, Escaping the Revolving Door. I'm John LaMaster. You're viewing the 12th now in the final video session now, the 12th session course entitled Escaping the Revolving Door of Prison. Be sure to view sessions 1 through 11 if you haven't already done so to get a thorough understanding of the complete course content and also hit that like button if you would to, uh, if you find this video helpful. If you know of others who could benefit from this course material, why not send them a message that they can review the entire course by simply going to YouTube and doing a search for Escaping the Revolving Door of Prison. They'll certainly thank you later. In our last session, uh, session number 11, we, we brought the second part of a two-part series on the sixth reason the inmates attending our class at a correctional facility gave us reasons why men and women end up re being repeat offenders. They said they grew up in dysfunctional homes, uh, the influences of which caused them to face a lot of difficulties, overcome the negative influences of their upbringing, and, and it contributed to them having a, a lot of difficulties establishing healthy adult relationships and also caused them to face difficulties in their marriage relationships. In that session, we covered the subject of developing better relationships, uh, both in friendships and in marriages. We found that in order to develop better relationships, the first thing you're going to have to do is learn how to communicate more effectively. As we showed there, uh, uh, there's a lot more to communication than just expressing ourselves with words. So we began the process of becoming better communicators by first defining what communication is, what the two goals of communication are, and then looking at the uh, communication process in its simplest form uh, to determine when communication had truly taken place. We found that there were three types of communication, verbal, nonverbal and paraverbal communication and gave a brief a, a, a rundown describing what those three communication types are all about. Uh, next, we discussed that there's a good, to be a good communicator, we had to be truly listening to what other people were saying to us. And then we considered the seven barriers to active listening that uh, keep us from being good listeners and keep us preoccupied. And after that, we developed some additional information on improving communication by getting understanding of the importance of talking in terms of feelings and revealing our feelings rather than just giving our opinion or discussing things. Next, we began to develop an understanding of how relationships are developed by looking at a flow chart of the relationship cycle. Uh, develop, developed by a lady by the name of Millie Welsh. And finally, we discussed how to handle relationship conflict so that problems are resolved and both the members in a relationship feel satisfied with the solution. In this session, we'll be covering the seventh reason the inmates attending our cat class gave as reasons why men and women become, and become repeat offenders when they're released from prison. They said people on the outside just wouldn't give them a chance to start a new life. Uh, they wouldn't let them forget about the fact that they had spent time in prison and were convicted felons. Uh, they disrespected them and treated them with contempt. These inmates said they needed a breakthrough to know how to handle disrespecting people. In this last class of Escaping the Revolving Door of Prison, we want to show you how you can break loose from the mistakes of your past. If you've accepted the Lord as your Savior, uh, the Lord has truly forgiven you of your past and doesn't hold that, uh, the mistakes of your past against you and that keep you defeated. In this class, I want to go through a list of things that will help free you of the chains of your past and be truly set free to become all that God intends for you to become. We want to first look at the subject of guilt, shame, and regret to determine what role these play in keeping us chained to our past and answer the question, are these helpful or are they harmful? Then we want to investigate how we should deal with our past by looking at an example of a man from the Bible who had a past he had to overcome and what he did to overcome his past. Uh, we'll be looking at how to deal with the past, uh, how to function in the present, and then how to live for the future by pressing on. 
then we'll be considering what to do when people treat you with contempt because of your record and, and, and how you should respond in a, in a positive way to convince them that you've been rehabilitated and, and you deserve another chance at life. We'll do this by getting an understanding of perseverance, what it is, and then why we need it. Then we'll learn about a major study done by two psychologists by, by the name of Drs. D.A. Andrews and Dr. James Bonta uh, when they determine the major reasons why men and women reoffend. Uh, they discovered what they referred to as eight risk and need factors involved in future criminal behavior. You'll be covering these eight factors and what previous offenders can do to change the negative statistics of offenders to be drawn back to prison to serve another sentence for committing another crime. And then finally, we'll be covering eight steps on how to leave your negative past behind and move forward uh, beyond those mistakes in your past. We want to begin today's lesson uh, uh, discussing what Andrew, Andrews and Bonda found as the number one reason or indicator of future criminal behavior. They found that of all the eight risk factors, the number one indicator of future criminal behavior was your past history. And what I want to say is your past history doesn't define who you are and doesn't determine your future choices and your decisions. However, it can be a strong indicator of your future choices unless you begin to make adjustments in your choices that we learned about in sessions three and four of this course on how to make better choices. Uh, someone said your, your life today is the sum total of the choices you've made up until now. Uh, begin making better choices and you're going to reap the rewards and the benefits that, that come from those better choices. Uh, you can continue to do what you've done, but I want to assure you that you'll be back in prison for another go-around of this revolving door of prison. Uh, in order to change, you have to be man enough or woman enough to admit your past mistakes and want to change. Some men and women want to show how tough they are and continue doing the things that got them to prison in the first place. And, but they've determined this time they're going to do a better job and not get caught. If you really want to show how tough you are, then admit you've gotten on the wrong road and you need to get on the expressway to change and success. If you dwell on your past long enough, the first things that you're going to have to deal with is guilt, shame, and regret. Let's look at those. First, let's look at the, 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 the effect that guilt has on us. If you do something wrong that hurts someone else, what happens? You feel guilty. And because guilt is painful, people often find ways to soothe their conscience or their feelings by making up for their actions in some way. They may go to the person they offended and, and apologize, or, or, or they may try to make amends in some way. Psych psychologists like Jane Bybee, founder of Boston Leadership Institute, says guilt is actually useful because it gets people to regret the wrong they did and correct it. They feel a sense of remorse over it and wish they could uh, somehow undo the harm they've done. Guilt is a good thing for our society, she says, because it keeps people in check. Guilt says, I made a mistake, so I need to ask for forgiveness to get that off my chest and somehow try to make it right by making amends. Now let's look at shame. Shame is a feeling or awareness of dishonor, disgrace, and, or, or condemnation for the things we've done. Uh, this emotion is not helpful because unlike guilt that says, I made a mistake, shame says, I am a mistake and I'm a failure. When someone shames you, what do you want to do? You want to retaliate. We feel ashamed. We knew better. But we did it anyway. And we feel like a failure. Ask the Lord to forgive you. If he has, he has forgiven you. Now it's time to forgive yourself. You may feel your families are so ashamed of you. Uh, they can't forgive you, but they can and they will if you show them you've changed. 
But if you can continue to carry this shame, it'll keep you chained to the past and result in your self-condemnation and a feeling of disappointment in yourself that won't go away because you just won't be able to get free of those negative feelings about yourself. I asked once a, a member of our study group at a correctional facility where we were teaching what God thought of him. He began to say that God, he felt God was disappointed in him as a person, and he expected more. His, his response showed he was suffering shame, and it even projected his low self-esteem feelings onto God. I began to tell him that God wasn't disappointed in him at all. And that he loved him greatly and had a great plan for his life. God is for you, not against you. So you can put shame behind you and move on and cooperate with God and his plan. You're on God's team. And God's on your team. Wow, you can't possibly lose now. Shame will extinguish your hope for a better future. And will stop your progress if you let it. See yourself as God actually sees you, a mighty man or a mighty woman of God with a special purpose. Now let's look at regret. Regret is an emotional dislike uh, for our personal past behaviors. You know, we've all experienced regret over the past. It takes many forms. Regret over the mistakes you've made. Uh, regret over being hooked on drugs and alcohol and uh, regret about running around with the wrong crowd that contributed uh, to you going to prison. Regret over all kinds of sins and their consequences. Uh, you fill in the blank on this one. So what's on your list of regrets? Is there anything more painful in life than our regrets? What is regret anyway? Well, I would define it simply as a painful memory of a time when you wish you'd made better choices because of the consequences incurred by making bad choices. But you know, some I don't really think that definition is complete. In fact, I don't think that definition even remotely gets at what regret makes it so difficult for us to bear. There's one more critical component to, re to regret that gives it that incredible sting it has. Uh, let's add to that previous definition. Regret, a painful memory of a time when you wish you'd, done, you, you'd made better choices because of the consequences incurred by making those bad choices. And now here's the addition. Now it's impossible to change. That's what makes regret feel unbearable, isn't it? It's not that, that you slept with that person you shouldn't have slept with. It's that you can't unsleep <laughs> with that person. It's not that you said something you shouldn't have said. It's that you can't unsay it. You know, apologies are good, but, you know, they don't seem to un, uh, unsay the hurtful or angry things we've said. Sometimes we, we make these kinds of comments to others and, and, and wish we could just reach out and grab a hold of those words uh, before they reach the other person and draw them back. But it's just too late. They've already reached the person and done their damage. It's not that you, that you took this drug or that drug or drank this or that. It's that you can't untake those drugs or you, you can't undrink what you've drank. And you can't change whatever circumstances you and your loved ones suffered as a result. Regrets are painful because they're usually double blows. They're painful or embarrassing things we've done or said. That's blow number one. But here's number two, they can't be changed or taken back or made right. Uh, we've all been scarred and taken down at some point or another by that one-two punch of regret. Sexual decisions, financial decisions, uh, friendship decisions, substance uh, uh, decisions, legal decisions, employment decisions. The list is, is just endless. Now, what do we do? We feel the, the guilt of, of, uh, and shame that we discussed earlier, but regret and shame are anything but helpful. They're destructive and they're de debilitating and they drain us of hope. They allow the sins and mistakes of the past to reach out and poison our present. 
Uh, the past can even become a prison that's more confining than a physical prison to us. And if it's not handled appropriately, it'll just lead to more wrong choices and more regret in a vicious cycle. As Paul the Apostle writes in 2 Corinthians 7.10, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow, that's shame, brings death. Uh, many people live today plagued by their past. So how should we deal with the past? Well, there's three principal ways that we, we deal with the past. First, we, we relive the past. People caught in this pattern recount, recount the past in great detail in their minds over and over again. <laughs> I call it playing a record or a CD of your past. All the negative emotions that these people felt then, they, they feel them over and over again. These individuals continue to beat themselves up for events that are forever gone. And then secondly, we resign ourselves to the past. Some people surrender to the past. They decide that the past just defines who they are as a person, and they're never going to rise above the past, and, and they just resign themselves to be uh, what this past has made them. They believe that they, they can never be more than a product of their past. But the third one is people refuse to be dominated by their past. These people recognize that while the past is an unchangeable part of, our, of their history, we are more than what the past has revealed about us. And we do have a choice about how we can deal with the memories of the past. How can we deal with our past, especially if our past has been filled with wrong choices, uh, hurt, regrets, and disappointments? In this class, I want us to take a look at a, at a past of a famous man in the Bible New Testament and how he learned to handle his past. He was Saul of Tarsus before his conversion to Christianity. We know him by his Christian name, Paul the Apostle. Let's investi investigate the story of Saul or Paul's past. In Philippians 3, 5 through 6, Paul tells us something of his background. Paul was a Pharisee. So what's significant about that, John? Well, the Pharisees were one of the major religious parties or branches of Judaism that emphasized a strict observance of the law of Moses. They held a vast number of laws on, on ceremonial washing, eating, and strict observance of the Sabbath. They were very legalistic and judgmental. Uh, they took the Ten Commandments of God written in stone, as you'll remember, recorded in Exodus 20, in the Bible Old Testament, and added 603 other laws to make a total of 613 laws on every conceivable subject. Je Jesus, uh, in Matthew 23, 4, said that the scribes and the Pharisees had made the original commands of God grievous or painful to be observed. Because of his strong beliefs, uh, Saul began to try to destroy the first century Christian church because he believed it to be a threat to Judaism. Going from house to house, he dragged, dragged off men and women and took them to prison. Uh, he even went to the high priest and obtained letters from synagogue and, and, and Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged in the way, uh, he might take them to, as prisoners to Jerusalem. Uh, that's the term that, that he used to describe Christians. But on his 130-mile, six-day journey from Jerusalem to Damascus, Saul is met by Jesus when suddenly a light from heaven flashes around him. He's blinded by the light, falls to the ground, and hears a voice say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Uh, who are you and what do you want me to do, Lord? Saul asked. Well, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. The Bible goes on to record that Saul of Tarsus goes into the city, is prayed for to receive his sight and the Holy Spirit. He's born again and he is baptized just like we are today. 
at once the Bible says that Saul began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. He knew that for certain because of his Damascus Road experience. There was an immediate change in Saul. Saul's arguments were powerful because he was a brilliant scholar. But what was more convincing than that was his changed life. People knew that what he taught was real because they could see the difference in his life. But Saul had a major problem. The church remembered the way he had been. They remembered his past. And so he had quite a task to convince them that he had truly changed. You're going to have a similar task convincing others that you've changed too after your release from prison. Because of Saul's past and what the Lord did for him, I believe we can listen and learn from him. In, in Philippians 3, 12, and 14, Paul gives us a prescription for dealing with the past. Here's what he says. Forget it. <laughs> listen to what he says in verse 13. But, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and straining toward what's ahead. Uh, Paul says the past is to be forgotten. But what does Paul mean when he says, forget the past? Is he saying that somehow we should develop selective amnesia about our negative past? Although there may be things in our past that we'd like to erase from our memories, God has created our minds to be incredibly powerful. Even when we can't remember something consciously, subconsciously, it's always there. Every act, word, event, uh, situation, and circumstances is embedded forever in our minds. So when Paul speaks of forgetting the past, he means that we must forget it in the sense that we no longer allow the past to control our lives in the present. For the many, the, uh, the, the past is holding them hostage to, to past failures and mistakes and poor choices and disappointments. You may be saying, well, John, <laughs> that sounds a lot easier to be done than, than what you're making it out. And, and you'd be absolutely right, right but, but, but by God's grace, it can be done. You see, Christ can liberate us from the past. The, the Bible tells us that he came to seek and save the lost and bring us an abundant life right now, according to John 10.10. 10. Read that, and you'll find it out. The reason that Jesus came to earth was to offer his life on a cross so that our sins might be able to be forgiven. Jesus can completely forgive our past. There's nothing in your past too great for God to handle. There's no sin too big for God to forgive. Uh, he can enable us to avoid living in the what has been and live instead now in the what can be. Paul himself is his example of this truth. Paul had a dreadful past, and it could have easily haunted him for the rest of his life had he allowed it to. He could have walked around his whole life with a tremendous burden of guilt and shame and regret that crippled him. And he'd never become the great apostle and missionary for God that he went on to become. Many people dwell on their past failures, mistakes, and sins so much that they become totally paralyzed, unable to live productively. Paul's telling us that we can turn over our past sins and our failures to God and start moving forward to what lies ahead. Paul's testimony uh, holds out hope for all who would believe that they can never rise above their past. In a very real sense, every person, including me, can say, I failed in the past. I know it. But this is not the best I can be, and it's certainly not the end of my story. We are called not only to deal with the past, but to function in the present. Let's look what the, the finishing part of that verse 13 is. I just read it a while ago. Straining or reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Paul says that we must not only forget the past, but we must also actively engage ourselves in the present. You can't strain forward if you're pessimistic. You'll say, what's the use? I'll never amount to anything anyway. Whatever I do is going to be a failure. 
I see the mistakes of the past can cause us to see ourselves as failures. But a wrong choice or even wrong choices uh, doesn't make you a failure. You only become a failure when you give up. You give in and go along with bad choices and blame others for your, for your problems. Blame your circumstance. Blame the way you were brought up, the environment that you, were, that you grew up in as the reason for your failure. Pessimism has to be replaced because it's extremely unhealthy. Because it creates a cycle of depression, despair, and regret. Uh, you know, we can become locked into a pessimistic way of life and thinking. When we begin to think this way, we have convinced ourselves that the good things of life are always beyond our reach. Let me tell you a little story. A man was walking by a little league baseball game and noticed a boy sitting at the end of the bench. He asked the boy, well, what's the score, son? Oh, well, 17 to nothing, replied the boy. Oh, my, I bet you're discouraged being that far behind. Why should I be discouraged, said the little boy? We haven't had our turn at bat yet. Now that's the kind of optimism we need. We can be optimistic whenever we come to understand that God truly has a plan for our lives. According to Jeremiah 29, 11, that I've mentioned many times in this class, uh, we can begin to look to the future with hope. Notice 13, uh, ver 13 also says, Brethren, I count... Uh, not myself to have seized this, seized this idea, but this one thing I do. Notice he didn't say one thing I think I'm going to do. Uh, he didn't say one thing I, I, I'm going to do one day when I get around to it. He said, this thing I'm going, I do. Paul was living and acting in the present. I think Paul's an ultimate example of living each day to the fullest. Living each day is a, as if it were your last one. For example, when he was imprisoned in Rome, yes, Paul was in prison. He didn't sit there stewing, thinking about all the things he could do or would do when he got out of jail. He wrote letters to churches. He sang praises to God and even converted some of the people in the prison, those who had imprisoned him. We're called not only to live in the present, but to live for the future by pressing on. Look what he says in verse 14. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God. Paul is determined to focus on the future, not the past. He's not simply reaching forward. He's giving his all to the endeavor. The word he uses here is a word picture of a foot race. It denotes the idea of a persistent pursuit in ancient times, they'd take a victor's wreath, a, a prize, and, and put it at the finish line so that runners as they ran could see that prize before them. It, it would help to motivate them to try to give everything they had to win that prize. But the race could only be won when the runner gave his, the race his full attention. You know, Paul must have been a sports fan <laughs> because he compares life to a, a wrestling match in Ephesians 6, 12, a foot race in Hebrews 12, 1, and, and a boxing match in 1 Timothy 6, 12. Uh, those are all action terms that we're all familiar with. Paul tells us that he presses on. This is the same word he used when Paul talked about his passion in persecuting the church. He now has the same intensity and determination in pursuing God's plan for his life. Uh, he, he, we should have at least the same desire to improve ourselves as we have had in the past, to serve ourselves, serve our addictions, and run after pleasure. Uh, we must have this kind of persistence and determination uh, to focus on the future uh, if we are to become and overcome the demons of the past. Now, what can you do when people treat you with contempt and scorn you because of your pr prison record? There are two scriptures that can give us some keys to success when people treat you with contempt. 1 Peter 4.8 tells us to forgive and disregard the offenses of others. The Greek word here used to describe this 
uh, it, it, it is the, a description of the muscles of an athlete straining to win a race. Uh, we must be straining to demonstrate forgiveness to other people. Colossians 3, 12 through 15 tells us to put on kindness and perseverance. Uh, you'll have to learn to be a bigger person than those who treat you with contempt are because of your past. Uh, to be successful in this world of opposition, uh, uh, you will face on the outside, you're going to need a healthy dose, dose of perseverance. You're going to have to go through some hard times uh, to get to the other side and get to good times, the good times that you desire. For you to be successful on the outside, you're going to have to be persistent and consistent. You're going to have to learn to ride out storms. You're going to have to ride it out until bad becomes good. Wrong turns to right until your weaknesses become your strength. You may not understand why people are the, are the way they are, uh, but you're going to have to stand up to it. When you don't know what to do, write it out. When you're not happy in your own skin, write it out. You can't just do the right thing when you feel like it or when you're encouraged, but when you don't feel like it, you're discouraged. You can't just do the right thing occasionally, but every time they have the opportunity to make a right choice and treat others better than you're being treated. You see, you are in, the, in it to win it. When others treat you badly, it's not your business. Your business is how you treat others. So let's look at this thing called perseverance. So what is perseverance? Well, let's give us a definition. Uh, uh, perseverance is a steady persistence in adhering to a course of action or a purpose and a, and a persistent determination in, in spite of difficulties obstacles or discouragement that requires endurance and tolerance let's look at this endurance is the power to withstand hardship tolerance is a capacity of of an organism to uh, tolerate unfavorable environmental conditions perseverance means being able to handle our difficulties with uh, self uh, self control and not get carried away with our emotions or reactions. So why do we need perseverance anyway? Well, perseverance is probably the the most important key to success in any endeavor. Let's look at what some people have said about it. Theodore Roosevelt said the the world needs the kind of men who do not shrink from temporary defeats in life, but come again and wrestle triumph from defeat. Wow. What a powerful line. What some other people, uh, famous people have said. The difference between a successful person and others is not a lack of strength, not a lack of knowledge, but a lack of will. Uh, that was Linsom, Vince Lombardi. Uh, Babe Ruth said, every strike I, I, I swing at the ball brings me closer to the next home run. Nelson Mandela, Mandela, the South African political leader, said this, I have, I have walked the, the long road to freedom. I, I've tried not to falter. I've, I've made missteps along the way, but I've discovered the secret that after climbing a great hill, one only finds that there are many more hills to climb. Uh, I've taken a moment here to rest, but I can only rest for a moment. For with freedom come responsibilities. And I dare not linger, for my long walk hasn't ended. Uh, Randy Potts said, Sometimes when we try to accomplish great things, we run into the brick walls of resistance. Brick walls aren't there to, uh, to keep us out, but to show how badly we really want something. To change others' opinion of you, show them that you are better for the experience of prison. And show them how you've changed. You are not the same person you were then when you went to prison. Take responsibility for your actions, but, but put a positive spin on your experience. Stress you've turned your life around since your conviction. You've made changes in your life to make sure that you never go to prison again. 
some other things you can do to show other that, that, that you've got to change life. Don't allow your emotions to control you. Uh, when you're insulted by other people, keep you cool and, and do unto others as you would have them do unto you, as the Bible says. Be good to people even when they're not good to you. Remember your goal. Show maturity. What's maturity? Well, maturity is, the, the, is learning to walk away from people in situations that threaten your peace of mind, your self-respect, and your self-control. To the best of your ability, keep doing what's right. You'll mess up, but don't stay there. Get up and try again. Remember how a baby, when it's learning to walk, falls down many times, but it doesn't stay there. It keeps getting up to try again. Mother Teresa of India gave us some great words to live by. In fact, I've got this, this chart of, of words hanging on my wall in, in my office. And she says the following. People are often unreasonable and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. Uh, if you're kind, people uh, will accuse you of ulterior motives. Uh, be kind anyway. If you're honest, people may even cheat you. Why don't you just be honest anyway? If you find happiness, people are going to be jealous of you. Oh, but just be happy anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. That's okay. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you can. And it may not be good enough, but give the best you got anyway. For you see, in the end, it's between you and God. It never was between you and them anyway. <laughs> Now let's look at the criminogenic risk and need factors. Uh, quite a bit of research has been done to identify criminogenic risk and needs. It, it's a tongue twister of a phrase that refers to the major risk factors and needs uh, associated with criminal conduct. Uh, these needs are characteristics, traits, uh, and issues that relate to a person's likelihood uh, to reoffend and commit another crime. As I mentioned, Dr. D.A. Andrews and Dr. James Bonta conducted numerous studies on both men and women, inmates, using various methods, including psychological testing, face-to-face -face interviews, to find out what factors predisposed or inclined previous offenders to criminal behavior after release from prison. Uh, their overall goal was to determine what the level and focus of services should be to provide to inmates to aid in their rehabilitating them to keep them from reoffending re when they were released. Uh, they found through these extensive studies what they refer to as eight risks and needs associated with reoffending that we want to cover in detail. As we've discussed in this course, within three years, approximately 75 to 82 percent of people released from prison commit new crimes and are returned to prison. So lowering this statistic is critical to improving the lives of inmates. You know, the person imprisoned multiple times is devastated. But not only he is, but other members of the family, especially the children of parents, incarcerated or harm. Statistics prove that members of the family of the imprisoned, particularly children, are more easily drawn into antisocial activity and the life of crime. Following is a listing of the eight risks and needs identified by Andrews and Bonta with a detailed description and definition of each uh, basic need. Uh, uh, what we're covering these for is to see how, uh, what things you can do to change to help uh, negate some of these statistics. The big four, these are found to have the greatest influence on reoffending by released inmates. The term antisocial will be used a lot uh, to cover when we get into these eight risks and need, needs. Uh, we defined uh, this term in class number two. Antisocial is used to describe people exhibiting any sort of behavior that's contrary to the laws and customs of society with the intent to violate the rights of others. Let's look at the first one. I mentioned it earlier, the history of antisocial behavior. The risk factor is early involvement in, 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 in 
antisocial activities. Uh, major indicators include being arrested at a young age, uh, a large number of and a variety of prior offenses and rule violations. What's the need? Well, history can't be changed, but building up a belief in themselves that they can avoid criminal activity by changing how they view themselves is, is necessary and beneficial. Number two, on the list is antisocial personality traits. Uh, the risk factors is the person is habitually deceitful. He's irresponsible. He's impulsive, violent. He shows a reckless disregard for others' safety. Uh, they fail to conform to the social norms and laws. And they show little remorse for the mis mistreatment of other people and are unable to control their anger and lack self-control. So what's the need? Well, the need is to learn to manage that anger, uh, develop a respect for the feelings and rights of others, and then learn self-control. Number three is, is antisocial thinking. Uh, risk factors there exhibit uh, uh, thinking errors with attitudes, values, and beliefs favorable to crime with negative attitudes toward the justice system with a victim mentality. Oh, the system's out to get me. Confuse wants with needs and are sensitive to remarks of others made that they interpret as being disrespectful. What's the need? Reduce antisocial thinking and feelings through building and practicing less risky thoughts, feelings, and learn about those 10 thinking errors that we covered earlier in one of our classes and how to overcome them. The fourth is antisocial associates. The risk factor is close friends who are rebellious and involved in criminal activity that provides a social support system for crime, for crime and isolation from pro-social friends. And research indicates the greatest predictor of criminal behavior, by the way, is antisocial friends. So what's the need? Obviously, reduce association with those friends. Learn, get some new friends. And, and enhance association with pro-social friends. So now let's look at the moderate four. These had less of an influence on reoffending, but they were still significant. Number five, family dysfunction. We covered that in one of our classes. Risk factors, upbringing spent, spent, <laughs> spent with dysfunctional parents who were abusive and not nurturing, who did not monitor and supervise them properly when they were growing up that contributed to them having difficulties developing wholesome relationships later in life. So what's the need? The need is learn to build healthy relationships and improve marriage relationships by developing conflict resolution techniques. We covered that in our last class. And number six, school and work-related reward and satisfaction. Risk factors are low levels of reward and satisfaction in school or in the work environment. A person may lack literacy skills and lack the ability to even complete a job or application or be able to write a resume. Uh, that's a major risk factor of them returning to a life of crime. So what's the need? Enhance rewards and satisfaction in school and our work environment. Become literate. Secure that GED, even in prison. Develop other skills to ensure job placement and learn how to write an effective resume. Number seven, leisure and recreation. The risk factors here are low levels of involvement and satisfactions in anti-criminal pro-social leisure and recreational pursuits. The need, get involved in these wholesome recreational activities. Uh, develop a reward mentality and enhance satisfaction in wholesome activities. And then the final one, number eight, substance abuse. The risk factor here is, is problems with alcohol and or drug use. Uh, current problems with substance abuse uh, indicates a higher risk than, than a prior, prior history of abuse. So what's the need? Join peer-based recovery support group after your release. That's key. 
reduce substance abuse, uh, reduce personal and interpersonal supports for substance abuse oriented behavior, and enhance alternatives to, to substance abuse. We talked about it in our section on, on drug, on uh, how to overcome drugs. As you can see from this listing of criminogenic risks and needs, this course has given you teaching and guidance in six of these areas. Nothing can be done about your past, past history. Uh, but as you begin to make better choices, you'll be going to reap the rewards of those good choices. Now let's cover those eight steps on how to leave the past behind and look forward to the future with great expectation. Uh, uh, you'll find yourself, if you find yourself stuck in the past, uh, remember not to be too hard on yourself. You know something? We've all been there. We all have a past, that, and that past could, could be the reason many of us can't seem to break through uh, in life. We all go through stages in our lives where we've spent so much time dwelling on our past that we fail to see the opportunities that are being presented to them to us every day. Uh, there's no doubt we've lost many opportunities and made mistakes, so we need to let go and go after these new opportunities that are constantly presenting themselves to us. The future is the place you can do the repair work and repair all the damage as you've done in your life. The following are points from knocking out your failures, fighting for success by George's St. Pierre, and on addictedtosuccess.com that I found online. Number one, give all your mistakes, shame, disappointment, and failures a name and write them down on a sheet of paper. Read the list out loud and then rip it up after reading it. See this as your release from those bondages. Refuse to remain imprisoned by your past. In fact, don't allow yourself to even consider giving up and going back to the way you were. Number two, respect those past mistakes. <laughs> your mistakes were a part of your experience at the time. Look back at them and realize that those mistakes you made then can now be overcome because now you have the time to make things right. Uh, you shouldn't be happy that you messed up, but see it as a part of the learning process because those mistakes, uh, you are now a different person. Number three, don't belittle your achievements. Uh, when you spend time regretting the past, you're ignoring and diminishing all that you've achieved because the past mistakes are the ones that seem to get all the credit. Focus on your achievements and not on your mistakes. And number four, don't let your mistakes be your final chapter to your story. If you're constantly being reminded of the mistakes you made, you, you'll make the things you did your life story. You never want the best times of your life to be overshadowed by your mistakes, which were only just a small portion of your life. If you were asked to write the story of your life, uh, would your past mistakes be the, the majority of your story? I don't think it would. So leave the past and move on. Number five, do not let the past ruin your present life. Do not erase your present life by staying in the past. You can't spend your time worrying about the things you should have done differently. While dwelling on your past, you're dishonoring your present life. Uh, you'll be able to be happy where you are now. Uh, do not rob yourself of your happiness. Number six, learn the lessons from your past. For many of us, uh, our mistakes are how we define ourselves. We must, must remember our mistakes are who we really are. Unfortunately, life gives us a test first and then teaches the lesson afterwards. Uh, your mistakes are only part of the learning process. The message in your past uh, should be used to build yourself a better future that is rich, happy, and successful. And number seven, forgiveness will be a tremendous asset to help you move forward. 
Too many times we hold ourselves hostage by not forgiving others and ourselves for, for past indiscretions. We, we move forward. Uh, to move forward, you'd have to let go of the hurt and pain that's been holding you back. What is forgiveness allows you to move ahead freely. Forgiveness does more for you than for anyone else. Let go so you can live freely. And then number eight, be a help to others by using your past experience. We've all done things in our past that make us feel ashamed. We're no different, but do not let them keep you from forging a new future. Use those past experiences to help others who find themselves in similar situations. Use whatever you are ashamed of to be an example to other people. Let them know it's never too late to become a person they want to become. Uh, we all have things in our lives that we're not proud of and would love to erase from our memories. But remember, those are the things that make us who we are today. Don't be ashamed of your past because those are the parts of your life that have made you stronger, wiser, and more able to deal with life. Every day is a new day to start over and to learn something new. Let me give you some final thoughts on this session and then the course in general. Uh, remember, every person has a past. <laughs> uh, I think we've, we've said that aptly in, in, this, uh, in this section. All of us have done some things that we're not proud of. I have, certainly, and you have. But when we look back at the events of, life, of our lives, uh, there's some achievements that we are proud of. The problem is the things we're not proud of cloud out those achievements and good choices we've made uh, because there's a tendency in all of us to remember the things that, that have ended up causing us pain, embarrassment, guilt, and shame. I, I'll give you a great life lesson here to learn is when you look back at your past, it should be look like looking like you were and looking out the rearview mirror of a car. Note the rear view mirror is, a, is very small and compared to the windshield in a car. So the idea here is to uh, concentrate on where you're headed and not so much on where you've been. Dwelling on the past will rob you of looking forward uh, with anticipation to your life ahead. It'll change you and chain you to the failures of the past. Now for some general comments on this course of study. I, I'm going to say we've certainly been on an awesome journey uh, over these last 12 sessions uh, covering the seven major uh, contributors to reoffending. As I mentioned in class number one, my wife and I didn't propose these seven reasons why men and women reoffend. Uh, they were given to us as responses from inmates who told us why they reoffended and what they thought caused others to reoffend as well. We simply took what they gave us as reasons, researched what could be done to minimize or eliminate the power and influence these factors had on them. Uh, that resulted in the birth of this course of study. It's our hope that the information you've gleaned from these videos will help you realize that you can be a success when you're released and never reoffend and be sent to prison again. Your life is much too valuable to waste it locked up behind bars or razor wire fences. God truly has a plan for your life. If you'll cooperate with him, you're a mighty man or a mighty man of God, and he has a specific purpose for you being born that only you can perform. If you don't reach that destiny he's outlined for your life, we're all going to suffer because it just won't get done by someone else. My wife Kathleen and I want to thank you for being a faithful viewer of these 12 sessions of escaping the revolving door of prison. I want to tell you how much we have truly enjoyed <laughs> presenting this course of study. Our greatest desire for you is that you put into practice uh, what you've learned in this course to help you be a success when you're released. We believe that you will what you've learned in this course of study and God's help be truly rehabilitated. This is John LaMaster saying, 
Uh, I'm praying God's richest blessings on you and your family. So for now, remember, God loves you, and so do we.